Well, just to, to echo and to, to amplify what uh, some of the things the first two speakers um, spoke eloquently on, I think um, the nature of threat very much depends on which part of the neighbourhood you live in. Um, you know, in, in Ireland, we oftentimes are able to have debates and discussions about things that are never going to directly affect us. And sometimes we think, therefore, uh, is this really an issue that we have to focus on? And it's been to our detriment. And, uh, but, but thankfully, not to, to serious detriment from a physical point of view. Because as I listen to, uh, to, to the discussions here, and as I think about these, these matters, threat at the moment, for, particularly for us in Europe, I see it falling into three distinct areas. Physical, uh, cyber, and moral. Now, you could divide them up in different ways uh, according to how you want to look at it. But uh, the physical side of the threat, if we just do a quick whistle-stop tour around parts of Europe, uh, we've certainly uh, seen you know, a aggressive acts and it, with the annexation of Crimea, the ongoing hybrid war within, uh, with Ukraine. And there is a, a, I think there's... There's an element of this that hasn't been fully focused on uh, by the, uh, maybe the, the observers and the mainstream media when they look at the, this kind of uh, conflict. When you don't have nation state going up against nation state, the rules are different. In fact, there are no real rules. Hybrid warfare poses all kinds of threats, uh, unintended consequences. Let's take, for example, the downing of the, uh, the Asian airline. I would argue that that happened largely because that that campaign was being carried out uh, in a form, as a form of hybrid warfare. If there was proper command and control, the weapon system that was used down that airliner would not likely have been deployed the way it was. And it wasn't, it wasn't plugged into the kind of command and control system it should have been. So what I'm saying is hy hybrid warfare allows for non-state actors, a plethora of non-state actors, to take the field. And that poses all kinds of dangers. Uh, and and un unintended consequences, because again, the, the normal rules of warfare aren't being engaged in, and animosities, uh, inter ethnic animosities, are stoked up in a way that would not be the case if there were uh, nation state forces meeting nation state forces. Now, of course, that also, if, if it was nation state versus nation state, you've got the problem of escalation. Uh, but that doesn't look likely to be something that's going to happen, because I think. Uh, uh, our, our Russian colleagues have found that hybrid warfare is something that can be, give them a spectrum of options from hard-edged military to political and communications. Coming back to uh, another point, speaking of, of cyber, indeed our Estonian uh, partners have seen firsthand how cyber warfare can be used in such a way as to bring your nation to a virtual standstill in, in 2007, I think it was, and yet not be able to point a direct <coughs> finger at somebody. Um, there, there are a lot of holes, I would argue, in the cyber security infrastructure around Europe in general and around Ireland in particular. And uh, where that has particular consequences for us in Ireland, I think, uh, is with regards to our protection against uh, industrial and economic espionage, which is something that rears its head from time to time and gets you know, blown off a little bit in mainstream media and political circles as, as hysteria, but uh, certainly former colleagues of mine uh, take it very seriously, both within the, the, the military and the policing spectrum within this country. And how do you respond to that? It re requires you to have a more joined up approach than we have, I think, in this country. We're a little bit too ad hoc in our responses. Uh, uh, we, we need to pay attention too to the, the other developing, uh, less spoken about threats, physical threats too. Uh, we're aware of what's happening in Crimea, but for instance, our, our Scandinavian neighbours, the Swedes had to reoccupy Gotland Island in the last two years, I think it was. They had no, they had no military presence in that for a long time. And that was because of, of, again, Soviet military or Russian military elbowing into that area and activities in that area. The Norwegians, too, have had to start to uh, deploy special forces patrols along their border because of uh, Spetsnaz, R Russian special forces incursions. Not that they're looking for confrontation. It's a little bit of, uh, of, of what we talk about with the, the moral struggle going on here. Occupying territory, normalising it, uh, putting it up to uh, different of our European partners in ways that uh, require some sort of a response, but an appropriate response that won't be, uh, lead to escalation. And that's, that's quite difficult. It's, uh, you're talking about a joined-up military diplomatic approach and, and something maybe within Europe we need to, uh, to work on further. Um, and of course we saw 
the Scripple affair, and how that was, on a, to, to come to a kind of a positive note, that was a, a classic example of a, a big push morally against Western European values, and a surprising push back when Western Europe largely stood together as one and linked arms and uh, showed their displeasure by chucking out some diplomats. Uh, it was a diplomatic response that I would argue was quite appropriate. But in that period, we also saw it kind of, it, you know, it, it shone a light uh, on some of the holes in our security uh, architecture as a, as a series of partner states uh, within the European Union. And that kind of brings me to what I would say is the key, the key threat from an Irish perspective. Who, we're not in the direct front line. And I would say our threats uh, at this point are quite insidious. And uh, they're more of, of the moral nature than, we we'll say, the physical and cyber. Physical and cyber are important. Uh, certainly, it, it's not helped by the fact that we, we again, uh, uh, we seem to do this on a historical basis. Every, uh, every generation let our defense force capability uh, dwindle to a point in capacity because either personnel are being hemorrhaging out of it or the, uh, the issues uh, about paying conditions aren't being addressed. But as we're learning here today, defence and security are about more than just the military. And our population are quite infantile in their grasp of security and defence affairs. Uh, they're, they're quite sophisticated on many other levels, economically, politically, uh, and, and technologically. But when it comes to security and defence, we have, uh, because we've been diet-fed a lot of mythology, we, we, we tend to want to inhabit a zone that allows us to sleepwalk through the territory of threat. And it hasn't had a severe impact on us yet, but if we don't start to address it, I, I see two particular areas. One is we will be seen as a, as a soft spot. In fact, we already are. We are seen as a, a soft spot by a variety of, uh, of actors, state and non-state actors, uh, witness the attempts at economic espionage, but also the Russian incursions into our airspace because we don't have uh, proper radar systems that can track aircraft that turn off their transponders. That's just one example. And also our, uh, our, our response to things like PESCO, for example, which is a, a great opportunity for small countries like ours and, and other partner European nations to come together and share resources and share thinking and share expertise and bring something to the party and work on something that's particular to, uh, to our needs within a, within a cluster. And something of that benefit can oftentimes be torpedoed before it even begins because of the manipulation of sentiment. So that comes, brings me back to the point of the, as I was saying at the very start, the physical, the cyber and the moral areas. Within the moral area, and I, I suppose you could conjoin it a little with, with cyber, um, various entities, we saw Islamic State make great use of media platforms, social media platforms, to mobilize sentiment without any clear command and control. That had clearly uh, beneficial outcomes to their cause uh, in motivating people to, to engage in violent acts within Europe. We've also seen uh, within nation states, Russia invests huge resources with uh, uh, initials that will, uh, will strike a chord in this country with what's known as the IRA, their Internet Research Agency. And this isn't just about technological um, uh, advances to undermine states, but the mass use of social media as a tool to inject dissent and separation and division within peoples within Europe, and mass trolling that brings in issues to bear that motivate people and, um, shall we say, um, mobilize them and radicalize them to some extent. And an example of that could be uh, what you know, we see, certainly in Ireland, with the growing slightly more right-wing tendencies in people when it comes to migration and how social media has been used uh, to great effect at that. And nation states that are putting together offensive strategies using social media platforms, I think are one of the most fundamental threats to small states because they undermine our moral capacity to respond with a, a national mindset. And I'll round it up now and say that we, there are lessons though to be learned. And again, the benefits of being in, in a group, in an alliance, in a, in a partnership, whatever way you want to call it, 
is that other people have walked certain paths before us. And the Swedes, who were up against it in the Cold War, trying to, to plot a delicate path between their relationship with the West and the threat coming from the East, had in, had in place a, a national, nationally-led program of psychological defence, where they, they set about uh, mobilising the sentiment of their population. That was the primary thing. Their will to defend their homeland, their will to use all of their capacity, not just military, to, uh, to, to stand against aggression. And if we were to take that, some of those Swedish lessons, and marry them up with one of the, the, the big benefits of being in something like the European Union, which, as my colleagues have already said, the rule of law, the, the belief in the rule of law, the establishment of a rules-based institution which gives small states like ours a voice that we would not ordinarily have. Uh, and we've seen that come to great effect for this country with regards to Brexit. Uh, if this was 50, 60 years ago, we would not have had uh, some of the outcomes. I, I, I hesitate to say successful outcomes, because uh, unlike the government, <laughs> I prefer to count my chickens when they've hatched. But, um, but I think, yeah, to, to, to come back to that point, the European Union, it's a rules-based institution. Uh, the relationship that uh, my colleague here mentioned about uh, European Union and NATO, I think is fundamentally a good thing. It allows NATO to be the heavyweight, the heavyweight dog in the room when it comes to uh, kinetic defence. And it allows the EU to, cur to, to focus more on the issues with cyber, moral security, uh, and to continue to develop their instruments of conflict containment and conflict prevention. And uh, I, I think that's uh, something that we in this country can benefit hugely from, and maybe more importantly, contribute hugely to, given our experience. Okay, Declan. Um,